Today's edition of the podcast is brought to you by Coach Me Plus. Coach Me Plus is the leader in athlete management software and a product that I've been lucky enough to be using for a little over a year now. Only rivaled by the impeccable customer service that Kevin and his staff provides, Coach Me Plus's ability to constantly be amoeba-like in their ability to mold and, and matriculate what you're trying to get across and bring together is, is absolutely fantastic. Their constant pursuit of better ways and better methods and, and innovations and progress to their own product is absolutely fantastic. Go over to CoachMePlus.com, check out what they got, guys. It's, uh, it's something that I guarantee you won't be disappointed with. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have a fantastic talk with the Strength and Conditioning Development Coordinator from the Memphis Grizzlies, Chris Chase. And guys, this is an awesome discussion uh, about developing athletes in the NBA. We start out talking about the new position that Chris has in Memphis and how this is, uh, you know, how it's similar to college but different with the increased schedule of games and how that impacts things. Then we get into the staff and how each one of them has a has a unique and different role with each one of these guys they're trying to develop. You know, and then we get into how the college teams and the team, you know, that he was with before, the Atlanta Hawks, have helped impact what he's doing there. You know, and, and then we start discussing, you know, what he sees and, and where the benefits were from being in college first and the limitations um, that are placed on both the NBA, and working in the NCAA. Guys, it's really a fantastic talk. I cannot thank Chris enough for being so open, honest, and candid. Let's get right to it. Chris, thanks for being on with us today, man. Awesome, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so listen, let's, uh, you, you change zip codes. So yeah, let's talk dude. a little bit here about the, the, new, the new gig and what's going on down there in Memphis. Yeah, so I, uh, you know, left the Atlanta Hawks, uh, came to the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, so I now my title is the strength and strength and conditioning development coordinator for the team, and uh, it's it's a it's sort of a unique position. And you know, I'm tasked with uh, developing our young guys. And and what does that mean? Is you know, uh, we're we're taking this initiative and saying. Hey, we we've got these young guys that we can put on these long, this long term development program, and we need somebody to really pay attention to that, and we need uh, you know a, a coach devoted to that specific uh, demographic of guys, uh, that specific group of guys. So uh, that's what I'm that's what I'm tasked with, and it's really cool to kind of have that focused delegated responsibility uh, to those guys, and really you know, kind of continue what the, the type of training that they may have gotten in college, that more structured kind of collegiate required training uh, and continue that into the MBA uh, and beyond into, you know, in, into their as they go along in their career. Uh, so that's th those are my responsibilities, which I think, you know, uh, differs a little bit from Atlanta, where Atlanta, you know, it was kind of more widespread. Now I feel like I can really focus more on the strength and conditioning side for these young guys. Yeah, so really getting back to your roots is when it comes to being a strength coach and yeah, no, getting exactly. guys stronger and yeah. getting them moving the moving forward. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So now, coming from high level college basketball to the NBA, you're you're going to see a lot of similar type of athletes, I would assume. Just now, athletes that are playing three times as many games. Right. So how is this going to be? an intricate challenge to moving these young guys forward. Yeah. And like, that's, that's always the tough question. And I think this is where, you know, it, we can talk forever about, you know, uh, athlete monitoring and how they're subjected to load and why we're using, for instance, like uh, the fashionable topic of, of GPS and, and all these sorts of things because of the, of that subject, you know, of, of a guy that's coming in and used to a certain uh, load that they're subjected to, and then increasing that an inordinate amount in the NBA and saying, all right, like sink or swim. And we don't want it to be sink or swim. We want it to be this graded exposure uh, for these young guys uh, to set them up for success. And, and how do we do that? And, you know, on, on my side, you know, it's, it's, it, 
it isn't just me. And we have a, we have a great staff of people. We have a ton of people uh, on staff committed to come together and figure out how how do we plan to to set them up for success so they don't burn out or they heaven forbid, heaven forbid they don't get you know uh, we avoid them getting injured um, because we know that this is this is very new they're overwhelmed this is a new environment there's a lot of pressure uh, there there's more games and there's more time that they have to commit to this activity um, so so it's it is a tough thing and I think you know when when these guys come in they are introduced to to everybody and understand who uh how each person is going to play a role in their development for me it is on the strength and conditioning side uh for our analytics guys they're going to help them on on that side to understand you know why we may limit them on a load sometimes or limit them in activity or we may you know need them to increase their activity so you know, and that's and that's a very you know broad strokes type of explanation, but it's it's an understanding of it, it isn't just me saying okay, let's bring these young guys in and hey, you work with Chris on the strength and conditioning side, and and that's that's your development. You know, there's the basketball side, the strength and conditioning side, the nutrition side, the sports psych side, uh, you know, the therapy side, and and the analytics, and so all those pieces come into play, and I have to be good at coordinating and understanding, uh, you know, all the information that comes in from all sides and where I can apply that to, to these young guys to set them up for success, you know, so I can't just be, you know, hey, I'm, I'm in my tunnel, you know, tunnel vision, I'm in my silo, focusing on the strength and conditioning side with, you know, weight room and core activities or whatever we're doing and conditioning activities. It's like, well, I need to coordinate with the our, you know, uh, sports science guys to say, like, is this an appropriate intervention for these guys? Is lifting for this specific rookie or player, uh, lifting three days a week appropriate? Is it an, an appropriate intensity or volume or intervention for this guy? Uh, is that the biggest piece of the pie? Or is the bigger, bigger piece of the pie their court work? And what do they need to improve on the court? So maybe I'm more on the court with a specific guy because we're saying, hey, this guy needs, needs, work, needs basketball skill work and he's not moving well, so maybe the bigger slice of the pie that reduces the the weight room slice is the court work for me. And I'm then I'm coordinating even more with our sports science guys to say, hey, how long are we going? How intense are we going? I want to do these specific drills. I want to get this guy moving in different directions and cutting today. You know, what's that going to look like over the course of 10 minutes? Maybe we can go 15, and they can tell me those specific numbers, and then I can just hit the gas and say like. Hey guys, check out my drills that I want to do with this guy. You know, let me know, let me know how many reps or how long I should be going with this, with this person. And that's a great asset to have. And I'm lucky to do that. And again, it allows me just to practice as a strength coach, uh, and just have a more, uh, objective lens to look through when I'm, when I'm prescribing all this stuff. Now, how does the involvement with that vast array of individuals, um, impact, alter, or improve the you know the 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 library you have of modalities that each one of those guys has you know set aside for them yeah like you know i think uh it, when you you it, it's not an easy thing to have sometimes to have you know all these people involved maybe sometimes it feels like too many cooks in the kitchen but you know that's where you have to you know like every relationship it is work and you have to come together as a group and say, like, you know, it, this is kind of like and I've talked about this before, even, you know, the same with Atlanta and the same when I was in, uh, you know, a strength coach in college is I look at everything as like as as the slices of the pot. And and I, I'm understanding that my slice of the pot, the strength and conditioning slice for each guy is is not going to be is not going to be the same. It's not going to be the same size for each guy. And I'm not going to be. Uh, the same level of importance for each guy. So then it's, you know, I can, I can come in, come in with, you know, every, uh, there's no egos in the room and saying like, you know, whose, whose intervention or whose expertise is the most important uh, for this guy. So then as a, you know, as a therapist, maybe our therapist needs to step in and say, because of this person's injury history or where they're at in their return to play, 
or, you know, just uh, where they're at just in their career. If they're, you know, a veteran who is just somebody who needs kind of therapy to survive and stay on the court, you know, we have to make those decisions as as a group. And, you know, that's that's where it's essential to come together, you know, uh, each and every day and communicate with each other to say, like, you know, who's the guy? Who's the guy for player A, who's the guy for player B, C, and D, and, and there's buckets, and, and it's not going to be 15 different buckets, but, you know, uh, that's where the relationships really have to be dialed in, and it's it's really, really hard, as we know, if, if it's not. You know, we complain about this all the time as strength coaches, where, you know, it's, it's the departments being the buzzword being silos, and we don't want people to be in silos. We want to be able to coordinate. Um, and I think, you know, just like in Atlanta, it's the same same in Memphis. You know, you got a good group of people um, that really, you know, that really want to do well by these guys and have a genuine care for these guys. All the things we talk about as coaches and I can step back if a player, you know, uh, tweaks an ankle or, you know, has has an issue on the court um, where he may, you know, it may be an injury, but they can still do some stuff. That's a little bit outside of my realm. He's in a little bit of pain right now. So, you know, Eric Otter is a physical therapist. That is somebody who can practice w through that lens. He's licensed to do that. Or one of our other physical therapists that we have, you know, again, that's a luxury to have all those resources. Hey, you know, Eric can work with so-and-so. Alan Groover can work with so-and-so. Myself, I still have my guys that are on the performance, strength, and conditioning track because they're healthy and they're in the developmental group. Hey, I'm providing my intervention, you know, because that's appropriate for those specific guys. No, that's awesome. And, you know, it must be tough to have a resource like Eric there, you know, at all times. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, it's it's an awesome, awesome thing. Uh, you know, hey, it's, I, I have been I have been very lucky uh, to, you know, basically every job I've had has been like a continuing education opportunity pretty much. And just the guys that I've worked with, I think, you know, of course we can all say that, you know, but man, to look down the list of, of coworkers I've had, essentially, it's just like, you know, I'm, I am the, I'm, I'm the coach that I am today and, and I'm able to do some things purely because, you know, I'm, I'm chilling with, you know, Mike Ron Karate, who's an unbelievable physical therapist. And like you said, with Eric Otter, like, these really, really, and, and a, a number, number of other people that, you know, I can go down the list, but that are really sharp people. And it's like, you know, thankfully I'm a, I'm a single guy just hanging out where I can just chill with them after work. I don't have to go home to the family. I'm just having conversations with these guys. And it's like that not a lot of people get to do that. So that's a really cool thing. No. Yeah. That's awesome. And, uh, and one more guy that I'll give a shout out to the truth with in Atlanta. It's, uh, the reason I went shirt no tie on the bench for a year was Art Horn. So it's uh, <laughs> you know. Oh man, that's yeah. my guy. Yeah, that's dude. My... Nah. first He's seat not... on the bench now. What's up? First seat on the bench now. Man, it's. <laughs> I wish I wish I had this. I wish we could like screenshot this and put it up. But we one of our uh, our first uh, preseason games, Art was caught like LeBron was taking a selfie, and Art was like behind him. And he was caught like he looked like he was sleeping. So like we just from like week one, man, we were ragging on from day one because he's sitting on the bench like he's at the forefront of everything. And all of a sudden we just like the first picture we get of art is just like him sleeping on the bench. So, of course, we like we got that posted in the in the Atlanta facility. Like, what are you doing, Art, man? Come on. <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah. no, man. I mean, you know, his reputation precedes him, man. He's uh, he's an awesome dude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and did. A ton of great work up there in Boston, and yeah, it's uh, always will be a good friend. Yeah, absolutely. So, with your roots in college, and you now working guys more in that eighteen to twenty-two year old range again, how do you see the role as a college strength coach impacting this, and how do you see your role prior uh, with Atlanta kind of amoebaing the USC? And the ATL. Yeah, no, that's I, that's that's a great point. That's a great question because because uh, I see how like that those two experiences have really blended together to then put me where I am at now with Memphis, and it, it like it, it it has made me you know each of those experiences made me a, a much better coach, which is a really which is a really cool thing. And in in college when I was at USC um, as my most recent college experience. 
uh, you know, I had four teams. It's the classic college strength and conditioning experience where it's, you know, group group training and being a strength and conditioning coach in front of groups, as we both know, and all those strength and conditioning coaches out, out there that cater to bigger teams, man, it makes you a better coach, you know, to practice in front of groups uh, and practice your coaching essentially in front of groups. Uh, like, so that part of it, I didn't realize that until I got out of it into in, into the NBA, where it's like that's a that's a skill that those who haven't coached teams and groups, it is a skill. Like you know, seeing other people in groups, like sometimes like that's a struggle for people if they haven't had that experience. And I like I didn't connect the dots because it's kind of just like that's based on experience. It's like not a a classroom thing. Uh, so I think that was harnessed in the in those college years, um, and then. In Atlanta, then you transition to the NBA, and, you, and you're working more one-on-one, -on -one and you're working, you know, maybe it's maybe at max I'm working with like two, three guys at, at once, you know, before I have another coach in there or a physical therapist, like all the resources we had in Atlanta, like we're never like as a single coach working with more than three people, um, so uh, it's it's a different ball game, which is which is good in a, in a lot of ways because. All the things that you may have, you know, had kind of a negative outlook on or I may have in at USC in the group side where it's like, man, I'm only my coach to athlete ratio is should be illegal, you know, with one to 20 or one to 40 or, you know, whatever. Or maybe I have, you know, uh, myself and an intern and and whatever it is. But it's like, man, like this is this is almost not safe. You know, this is what it let alone maximizing uh maximizing the training that's being done and getting out of it what we believe we're getting out of it because you're turning your head and you know you're trying to teach and do all this stuff it's like man this ain't easy so the good part about working with a smaller group it's like all these things that we uh we want to practice at a level or a quality uh a level of quality um that you you can really only do uh with those smaller groups or working one on one and that's what i realized i think and this is no slight against college but it's like it's it's a it's a different ball game i can't expect if i went to back to college and i had larger teams of you know 30 40 some odd teams i wouldn't be able to program the same way that i do now uh in the nba um it cut because like I, my expectations not expectations but I would have to realize that because I, I got my head on a swivel and my resources are now, you know, I don't have as many resources and as many eyes and as many coaches on the floor with a baseball team or track and field or, you know, like how it goes in the fall with track and field. I got, you know, 75 kids or whatever trying to come into the weight room. It's like, how can I expect the level of training to be the, the, you know, sort of the Instagram training where everybody's perfect. That's, there's no way. So then how do I construct my training to do that? And thankfully I kind of learned that in Atlanta, you know, how to construct training in a way that provides that, like that really, really high level, really high level of quality and attention because it's one-on-one. -on -one. Now, how do we blend the two in Memphis? Because there's more opportunity now for group training because we have like our developmental guys and we have more of, you know, it's myself and four or five or six guys and, you know, uh, myself, uh, Eric, our other strength coach, uh, chat and, you know, it is, it is a bigger group setting and yes, we have more eyes on these guys. So yeah, it's still that like one to two, one to three coach to athlete ratio. But the mindset is like, Let's let's look at this as long term development. So it is that kind of college strength and conditioning because it is that 18 to 22 year old kid. But now it's you are older. You are in the NBA. There's different demands. So we do have to you know, it is more fine tuned. Uh, so I think, you know, long winded answer to the question is to say, you know, uh, something I didn't realize again with college is like how how much that group training experience now I translate to Memphis, how much of that programming aspect and the things that I learned from the guys in Atlanta, I plug that into the program in Memphis. So when I'm when I got guys that we're going through maybe, you know, speed, agility, quickness type training or we're going through, you know, uh, any sort of jump or plyometric work or we're on the track like that's my wheelhouse. Like the, the, that's the stuff that I love to get a group out in open space and move and teach them how to do these aggressive movements and, and go through all that stuff in a group, 
that's what I love. And that's what we're able to do more here in Memphis. And so like that's it, it is fun again to get like that kind of group setting again. And, and I'm a better programmer again because of, of the Atlanta side. No, and that's awesome because I think that a lot of people, when they look at like how things are set up in college with all of us in, in basketball, I think a lot of people look at that position as kind of the anti-college strength coach position in that like yeah. we're able to work with like four, five, or six guys at a time. Yeah. Um, but then at the same time, having those bigger groups – makes you still coaching your toes a bit. Yeah, for sure. Um, but what are some things, because you, you mentioned earlier, and, I, and this would be very interesting to me, what are some things that if you went back in now and you had a track team again or yeah. you had a baseball team, what are some things that you are doing now that you're seeing some great success with that it would break your heart that not you wouldn't be able to implement, but you would be limited by that, by that size. And what are some things that the small group is limited by without having the size of the big group? Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, it's, it, it's a cool question, man. It's, it's, uh, it, it's just, it, it is first and foremost, first and foremost, it's, it's fun. Like I'm thinking as you're asking that question, it's like, it's, I haven't been in this for, for a long, long time. It's, it's been maybe, you know, five, six, seven years that I've been out of grad school or whatever it is. But, uh, you know, I, I think college seems so, you know, far away where, uh, be just because of how my coaching and programming and how I do things has, has evolved. And that's, and that's a good thing. Like everybody experiences that. Um, and if, if I went, if I did go back to college, I think more of my, my thought in, in, you know, in that question is like, the some of the things that I did in in college, maybe realizing more now what's what is worthwhile and you know what is actually what is act what actually has a chance at making a change uh, because I, I can never speak in absolutes because I think that's absurd as a strength coach like we never know we don't know if this stuff this stuff is actually translating uh, to sport and I always keep that in mind I always keep that perspective and I. I, I think if I am in that college environment with a larger group, uh, having an understanding of, of what is worthwhile uh, more so than I did, um, you know, three years ago when I was working in college. So, you know, I think some of the things we do now uh, are things that I did in, in, in college that are like the NBA guys love, you know, like I don't think you see a lot of, um, you know, I, I don't know. Obviously, I don't see everybody's program in the off season, but like I said, the things that I absolutely love and I feel are so beneficial uh, are that that speed, agility, quickness type work uh, like, you know, uh, you know, our jump and our plyometric work, our conditioning work like that's that's the stuff I love. And the, the weight room, of course, is a compliment to that. Um, and I don't we implemented that in Atlanta. We now implement that in Memphis. And I don't think you see a lot of it in the NBA and the guys love it. And so it's almost like that. It's like, man, some of this college stuff, um, you know, really should be should be uh, plugged and played more uh, in the NBA, even with guys that have been around in the league for, you know, four, five, six years. Um, they still really enjoy this stuff because it's very mindful, detailed, deliberate work that we're going through. And it's like, man, checking in on how you actually move. It's so funny when we do some of this stuff, some of our guys are like, Man, it's like I'm out here like with a with a uh, football trainer or something just because we're doing cone drills. And it's like it's that foreign to basketball guys to like do this sort of, you know, I don't want to say deliberate because, of course, like we're going through and we're we're being deliberate and detailed and we're going through parts of drills and then we're making them reactive and building that bridge to basketball specific stuff. But it's it, it's funny when guys are like, man, I'm, I feel like I'm at the uh, football combine and it's like, man, you haven't done this stuff in a while or ever, you know, and it's like how valuable this stuff is for them. So that's plugged and played from college. And I think, you know, stuff that I look back on college that maybe in a group setting, uh, like I wouldn't be able, wouldn't be able to do. And that's what I think of when you ask that question is like, you know, it's, it's a, it's a tough, like, I know this is a tough subject that everyone is, it's such a polarizing subject, but you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be weightlifting with guys, for instance, 
unless unless I had to, unless a, a coach made me, I'm skilled enough to do it. I'm skilled enough to teach it. And that's uh, that is my own opinion based on my experience before everybody goes nuts. But and, and I've said something different before based on my previous experiences. I've, I have said to an audience that we do uh, with my baseball team, we do use weightlifting or Olympic lifting or whatever you want to call it. Um, we do use weightlifting exercises. So I've said that in the past. And now based on other experiences, now I would go back because of the limited time that I have and knowing having perspective again on what is worthwhile and what I believe is going to transfer, hopefully maybe have a chance at transferring. It's just too long for me because I need to have my head on a swivel with a track and field team. It's like, you know, I can, I have a better, I have a better shot or more of a chance of getting these guys, uh, to, to jump, uh, to throw med balls, uh, you know, all the things that everybody has the same conversation. If you're not a weightlifting guy, you start talking about jumping and throws and all this yeah. stuff and I, whatever. But like, you know, I, I know I can, I know I can get somebody on a trap bar deadlift and have them look better than if I'm, you know, going through, like I've done in the past, like weightlifting instruction progressions that took me 15 minutes, you know, like be real. Like another coach may be able to say like, Oh no, I can do it quicker. Like it doesn't take that long. Like, no man, like going through instructional mechanics, warm up sets. And then like your, uh, before your working sets, some of the, some of the work that you're doing in those lifts. Yeah. You've got your other, uh, other stuff you're doing in, in combination with that, your a twos and threes or whatever, how you program, but it's, it's carves out a significant amount of time. And I don't know if it's worth it, especially if I had basketball, like a lot of time in basketball, like in college, like, I don't know how much time you get, but maybe you're getting 30 minutes, 40 minutes. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get guys, you know, like I talk about with, with the trainable exercise menu, man, like what is trainable for this guy? And I only got him for four years or whatever, you know, four or five, one year, maybe. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what if, what if you had, you know, any strength coach, you have a guy, we'll say basketball because of the one and done, like, Man, if I got a guy for one year, like if I really taught them how to like, you know, do do things that sets him up for the rest of his life. And I don't think there's some things that I just don't believe check that box in terms of like this is principle based movement practice that now you can carry on and understand for the rest of your life, you know. I, what are the principles of a squat? What are the principles of a hinge movement? What are the principles of, you know, uh, you know, all the horizontal pushes and pulls and vertical pushes and pulls? And it's like, you know, and then what is the trainable exercise for each of those guys in each of those categories? And I just now I now I, and some of that was happening, I think, towards the tail end when my third year at USC. But um, now I would go back and like that's like I use weightlifting as an example because I know that's one thing I would just take out, you know, and I would I, and I think I would be more efficient. I think I would uh, put less undue stress on novice athletes, uh, on, on athletes that, you know, aren't as skilled in, in lifting as sometimes we probably think we just we I think we sometimes we we overestimate their skill and we we confirm that based on the fact that maybe some numbers went up uh but i look at it as like they're just really resilient they're just really resilient athletes that you are putting a stress upon them and they're they're just resilient to that stress and nothing is breaking yet and you know so that's that's why i think of strength and conditioning like i've said before that's an intervention like that is that is a stress that you are you believe to be an appropriate intervention for that athlete, just like anything else, just like therapy, just like nutrition, just like sleep, just like a medication, uh, just like uh, three on three uh, during practice, uh, just like any drill or just like practice itself. It's like all these things are interventions, but understand that those are those that's a stress that you're putting on that athlete. And that might be an unhealthy stress and it may not manifest now, but it may, that stress may manifest in some way down the line. And it's like, they got the stress of 82 plus games a year and practices and, and, and traveling. It's like, I got to make sure that that intervention, if it's like, if we're talking about the college thing again, I got to make sure that, you know, weightlifting is an intervention that is a necessary stress 
for this person to do better things on the court. And I could use other examples. So before, like, again, the weightlifting thing goes crazy because I, I love all the, all the weightlifting variations, Olympic weightlifting variations, doing them myself and teaching them and coaching them. But, you know, it's just a, like that's just an example of over time how things have changed for me. And, man, you know, they could change. I, I'm fully committed to admit that they could change back, you know. Um, but I think that's just the difference over the years from college uh, to pro. That's that's killer. And I, <laughs> what I love the most about that is, is really, you know, the, the, the two parts right there at the end um, – Understanding the fact that, you know, like, I love the power lifts. I'm probably not going to get all my guys to squat USAPL triple white light depth. Yep. <laughs> you know, and I'm probably not going to have them arch their backs on the bench like they're in a bench shirt. Exactly. You know, understanding the difference between what Jay and Chris really love to do may not be what's best for you know, your center, you right. know, um, right. And, and right. That, that, I mean, and sorry to cut you off, but like, oh. that's one of the, one of the biggest things was, uh, I forget. And, and I mean this, I take so much from, from Mike, from Mike Ron karate, like the, the dude has gems for days, but like, you know, it, athletes are not necessarily healthy individuals. And it's like, playing a sport is not a health related activity. You know, it's, you know, so these these dudes are sack football, especially. That's an easy example. It's like there's a lot of sacrifice that's going on, and there's a lot of stress on these guys. And that's not just NFL. That's as we are seeing now. Like the concussion topic's an easy one, where it's like, hey, realize that, like, you know, as an athlete, like, you know, look at these guys that retire and how and how kind of jacked up they are a lot of times. And that, so let's not think of this as these like this is like health and wellness. Like this is performance. Like this is an understanding of like these dudes are sacrificing probably some years on the back end uh, to place this this stress upon themselves. Just like somebody who's, you know, on Wall Street or whatever, like we know, like that is a very stressful job. And we always say like, oh, that's probably taking years off your life. It's like, yeah, some this stuff in sports and training and basketball and like playing in the NBA, like that's not like these guys aren't like the picture of health and wellness. So I have to again be like really careful as to like man I'm I am the I am the guy applying another stress to them you know like a therapist is is you know a lot of times and they're applying stress to guys in return to play and stuff like that or an athletic trainer like our massage therapist like that's a that's a like let's let's calm this down a little bit like let's let's make you feel better my job is like hey all that stress you just put on yourself in practice and games well I'm going to put more stress on you and so it's like, that's a fine line. Like you gotta, you gotta really be on your game and to understand what's the right stress to, to subject these guys to. Yeah. And then this, that's fantastic points, which leads into the next one. Um, you know, the idea that you have to be flexible with what you're doing and know that you're going to evolve as a coach with the weightlifting example you used. Um, and now being in a position where literally the stress you're placing upon them is a factor to the vehicle they have for their living. Mm. How autonomous are the athletes in the NBA when it comes to this multi-headed approach that you guys have? Like, How often are the players involved? How much say do they have in things? And how open are they to contributing? Yeah, and, and I'll be, you know... Uh, very general and broad strokes with this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I think uh, they, there, there's a fine line, I think, you know, it, to, to answer this question, I think in maybe my own way, like uh, may, there, there's a fine line uh, between this, uh, this culture that you're trying to set up. And I think that's, that's probably a key word in answering this is to say like, it, it is, it is essential. And no matter where you're at, whether this is pro or college or anywhere in any industry, you know, what, what is the culture, um, that you, that you are fostering in your organization? And I, I, I think that is, that is huge. And 
man, we uh, had Brett Bartholomew come in uh, in Atlanta. And I just like that kind of re- reminded me of that conversation when he came in. And it's like we ended up talking about like most of our conversation uh, about culture and about just coaching and, and the things that Brett likes to talk about um, and that he that he knows so much about. And it's like it's it is such an if, if we want you know, how autonomous are these guys? Uh, you know, if, if we want them to be autonomous in a certain way, well, how are we setting up our culture in a way to foster that? And if we want them to be maybe more disciplined in a way, and we we lay our hat on and we emphasize like, you know, simple things, same as college, like coming in on time and like being prepared uh, and putting in effort. And, um, you know, then then what's the culture we're setting up to foster that? Are we educating them as to why all this stuff is important still, even as guys who make millions of dollars? Uh, you know, why is this important for me still? You know, I'm, I'm in the league now. Like, what do I need to do? Like, I'm, I'm in a high, I'm in a skill oriented sport uh, that I grew up just playing basketball to get better at basketball, you know, as is most like still the case with a lot of guys. Um, so that's work for us. And we, that's where as a, as a staff don't underestimate the culture piece. And I I don't think we do. Um, because that's, that's something that's going to allow for autonomy in a way that we want and maybe less autonomy in other, other places where we need to kind of not be disciplined. I I can't use the word disciplinarians in, in the NBA world really, but like that we can have more of a, of a say in what's going down. Um, not, and that's not the way to put it either, but like we there's, there's some order in that sense and they have less say. Um, so, uh, that's, I think that it, it's, it, to answer that question, I think it's, it's a culture thing and I I'm going to go back and forth and I am going to be like, I am approaching a player and I'm saying, Hey, I'm, I'm a resource for you. And here's, I'm going to describe, you know, what resource that, um, or what, what, uh, skills or things that I can provide for you. Um, as a strength and conditioning coach, you know, I'm on the performance side of things. And, you know, uh, these are, you know, the the things based on, you know, uh, assessments and uh, watching you on film, uh, and your your training age and your experience and your desires and what you like to do and your motor and all this sort of stuff. Hey, these are some things that I can provide that can help you out. That guy over there, he can provide some other stuff. But we're here for you. Like genuinely, we are here for you to help you. And, you know, as we know, it's like it is that like once they know you genu- genuinely care, um, then I think you, then I think you've got that that bond and that relationship where you can let them be autonomous, but they also don't want to disappoint you. So in other aspects, when you do say, hey, it's it's this time, it's this conditioning test. We got to hit this tomorrow before we head out on the road. I got you, coach you know, because we've built that relationship. And I mean, that's, you know, that's coach one-on-one for, for, you know, everybody, like we we talk about that all the time. Right. So, um, so I do like, that's key. That is key, man. And if we, if the NBA or or basketball in general, I think is, you know, is, is not the the strength and conditioning side. Like, as we know, it's not as common because they didn't grow up or like the uh, basketball players participating in the strength and conditioning side as a part of their training is is not as common as in other sports and we and we know that uh so we have to take that into account and we have to understand that's like you know yes your training age is is low and yes i am coming from the perspective that i know this is this is not football this is not uh rugby this is not something where you know we really have to uh maybe go balls to the walls more often in the weight room like i understand this this sport and i understand what your needs are and and that's that's all that I'm here to help you with, you know, no more, no less, you know. Uh, so I think there's a respect for that um, with guys. And like, you know, if we want to provide the level of care um, that we're looking to provide that I think a lot of these staffs now that are being built in the NBA talk about, uh, you know, it's it takes a lot of convincing. Like you just can't like plug a bunch of great people into a situation in basketball and expect all of a sudden all these basketball players to be like, oh, man, we've got a great performance staff. Oh, now I'm now I'm all about training. Now let's do all this stuff. Like it's like they didn't want to do it before just because we got the bells and whistles and we have like, hey, man, we got the greatest staff in the world here. We got 20 people that are ready to help you out 
and, and give you GPS units and like make your planned meals. And it's like, what if they don't want that? You know? So it's like when you walk in a room, like they, they're like, man, like, come on, how did, how did, how did this guy grow up and what did he do to get to the NBA? And I guarantee you, he didn't have a nutritionist and a dietitian when he was like in, you know, growing up and getting into high school, maybe college he did, but like, you know, we, I think that's a good perspective to, to work from is to say like, we don't know if automatically this dude is going to want and have this huge desire and and enjoy all the things that we're trying to provide, you know. And so we have to we have to kind of have that conversation and build that relationship first uh, to understand how this guy ticks. And and then maybe maybe they never enjoy strength and conditioning. And I am OK with that because maybe they're really playing well. And again, like I said before, I'm not the biggest piece of the pie with that guy. And that's OK. Yeah, no, and I think that that's a fantastic point and a, and a great spot to end it on, man. This is absolutely killer stuff, bro. And I can't thank you enough for being so open and honest and candid with uh, with me and the listeners today, bro. I, I really do appreciate the time. Absolutely. No, I appreciate you having me on, man. This was great. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Chris. We'll be in touch real soon, bud. Sounds good, Jay. Talk soon. Yeah. And a huge thank you again to Chris Chase for sitting down and talking with us today. Guys, I mean... It, Listen, like, a guy spilling the beans about what he's doing with the best of the best. I mean, we're talking about the 1% of the 1% when you're looking at guys in the NBA. You know, to, to sit there and, and talk about the role of the athlete in his whole process of developing it and, and how the culture of his team is really what drives the whole thing, I think is really fascinating. I, I can't thank Chris enough for spending the time with us today. I, I really hope you guys took something from it and, and enjoyed the talk as much as I did. And as always, guys, if you did, any questions, thoughts, comments, whatever it may be, leave them below. And we ask you again, if you did enjoy the discussion, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice. Smash that like button on, on iTunes, on YouTube, on Podomatic, whatever it may be. Share it through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, guys. Just trying to get great information out to great coaches. And, and Chris didn't hold back. I can't thank him enough for being so open and honest with us today and, and just sharing with all of us, you know, myself included. Uh, I can't thank him enough. Absolutely fantastic stuff, guys. And as always, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.